Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, let's stand together one more time. <clears throat> You know, I think one of the, the things that has happened, I know in my life and probably yours is through familiarity, sometimes we lose reverential fear of God and His authority, who He is. And I've repented of that in my own life and just said, you know what, Lord, I don't ever want to approach you or your word again without first stopping and realizing who I'm approaching. He's not just a king. He's the king of kings. He's not just Lord. He's Lord of lords. And so we come into his presence. And we thank, God, we thank him for his acceptance of us, number one. But number two, we want to respect and honor not only his word, that he gave us. He sent his word and healed us. But we want to respect and reverence his spirit and his office as our teacher. Amen. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you here tonight. We welcome you, sir, and we give honor to you. We thank you that you are our teacher. We know that I cannot see, ear cannot hear, and the heart cannot understand or receive the things that pertain to the spirit of God for these things are spiritually discerned. We must commune spirit to spirit tonight if we are to grow, if we are to learn, if we are to fully comprehend, if we are to walk in the revelation of this word. Holy Spirit, I just ask you to teach through me tonight, and I pray that you open the ears of our hearing, the eyes of our seeing, the hearts of our understanding. I pray that each one would receive revelation and just like a key unlocking a heart to be able to walk fully in our purpose not distracted here and distracted there but receiving the implanted the engrafted word which is able to save our souls and we thank you now, Lord, for the mystery being revealed. We thank you and we give appreciation for the mystery. We know that your word is not concealed from us, but for us. We thank you, Holy Spirit, sir. You're our teacher. You're our helper. Help us understand these truths and apply them to our lives daily. In Jesus' name we pray. If you're in agreement, say amen. amen. You can be seated. If you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to open to Romans chapter 12. I'm calling this message tonight, Your Gift, Your War. <laughs> your Gift, Your War. Turn around your neighbor and say, it's your gift and it's your war. Everybody has a gift and with that gift comes a war. When you acknowledge a gift of God inside you, you've picked a fight with hell. Oh yeah. When you acknowledge, you know, the Bible says, let the communication of our faith become effective by the acknowledging of every good thing in us in the Lord. And the minute we begin to give an acknowledgement that Christ, the hope of glory, lives in us, then we become a target and we have a war. I mean, the war has always been there, but it will intensify. And the more you press into Christ, it seems the enemy will begin to bring in the big guns on you. Why? worst thing he wants is a talking believer. I mean, he loves nothing more than a silent praying Christian, a silent uh, fellowshipping Christian. He loves isolated Christians. Amen. Amen. Friday night, he'd love nothing more than for you to stay home and isolate yourself instead of coming and fellowshipping with the church picnic. Oh, yeah. He'd love for you to stay home. Or even better than that, he'd like to get you in a movie theater. Yeah, where he can minister his gospel to you. Amen. Come on, somebody. It's your gift. It's your war. And you're going to have a warfare about your gift. That's why many believers never use their gifts. They don't make it through the warfare. To be able to do anything for Christ, you're going to have to overcome. 
And I think there's a reason. You know, I, I remember years ago, a guy, a guy walked up to me. He said, Pastor, you ever seen the difference between one who endures and one who overcomes? And I said, no, I never have. And he said, go through and run references on that and look at the reward difference between he who endures and he who overcomes. I thought that just intrigued me. So I went to my computer and I began to run the references. And sure enough, I found there's a huge difference between a guy who endures and a guy who overcomes. The Bible says he who endures to the end, he'll be saved. But when you start reading the overcomer's promises, whoo, son. Oh, yeah. It's like buying a car with air conditioning. Come on, somebody. It's like a padded pew. I mean, when you start getting into the overcomer's promises, go through and just look them up. And you will realize when you get in the overcomer's club, you're stepping into a whole nother realm of glory with the Lord. And you are stepping into a whole nother level of eternal rewards. So I don't want to just make it. I want to go in kicking and screaming, you know. I want to go in with gusto. I don't want to just barely make it to heaven. I want to be in the vertical leap position when I get there. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It's a familiar passage. If you come to this church, you'll hear it several times a year. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Say this with me. The first thing that's going to get in the way of me doing what God's called me to do is my body. Now turn to your neighbor and say, the first thing that's going to get in your way in doing what God's called you to do is your body. Now look back at him and say, there's only one answer for the body. Then you say back to him, kill it. Sacrifice that puppy. Put him on the altar. Put her on the altar. Because one thing about it, your body is not saved. Turn on your neighbor and tell me, your body is not saved. Your spirit is saved. Your soul is getting saved. But your body is condemned to death. The only one part of you that isn't going to heaven, that's your body. You're going to leave it here, planted in the earth. That's why God commanded the light to shine out of darkness. So the first step to fulfilling your calling God is overcoming the lusts of the flesh. The desires, the carnal desires of your body. It's desires. We've been teaching for the last couple of weeks about obeying the dictate of the spirit or the dictate of the flesh. And here we see it reiterated again by the Apostle Paul. Your body's got to die. I, I like the way one old preacher said it. The only problem with a living sacrifice, it keeps wanting to crawl off the altar. Hmm? I mean, some folks have a revolving lid on their coffin. You know, you were buried with him in baptism. We put the, the lid on the coffin, but for some reason, that coffin just kind of has a rotating lid, you know. You slide the lid off and... You slide the lid on and it just kind of whoop, slides off. Amen. I like what Pastor Brian says. It's illegal in Ohio and West Virginia to rob a grave. So every time you go digging up the old man, you're grave robbing. That's illegal in the kingdom too. You're, not, you're supposed to leave that old man dead. You're not supposed to wake him up with his desires and lusts and let him lead you back into what you came out of. The Bible says that's like a pig going back to the mud or a dog going back to his vomit. The body is the number one thing that's going to stop you from fulfilling your call. Sometimes your body's lazy and don't want to work. Sometimes your body, you know, there's something about this body. It always wants what's bad and don't want what's good. You know, this afternoon I went home. I said, body, you really need to do something today. To burn off all them calories you ate at lunch. My body said, I don't need to do nothing. I said, yes, you do. He said, no, we don't. 
I said, yes, you do. He said, no, we don't. You know what you need to do? I said, what? He said, we need to go right over in that recliner, lean that baby back and get us a nap for church. I said, no, what we need to do is go over and put in that insanity DVD, and get us about a 45-minute workout. You know what my body said? <laughs> but I won, glory to God. Amen. Then we went to the recliner. <laughs> Except this time we crawled. Couldn't walk anymore. Amen. And do not be conformed to this world. Okay, second problem. The world wants me to be like them. Second thing that's going to stop me from fulfilling my calling God and expressing my gift and service in His body is the world is saying, no, 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 be like me. They'll like you better if you're like me. And the world will give you all kinds of reasoning why you should be like it. I remember when I was about 17 18 years old, I remember my mom, she knew I was partying and stuff, and, and she had raised me to believe in Jesus, and I'll never forget this night, because it, it, it was a part of my memory, and she said, David, you have a responsibility, because you were raised in church, and these other boys weren't, and you should be living a life in front of them that demonstrates what it means to be a Christian. And I remember I looked at her and I said, Mom, if I don't smoke dope with these guys and party with these guys, they won't listen to a word I got to say. She just got mad and walked off. I went back to my party. Never got anybody saved. We talked about Jesus, but no one ever repented. Did the same thing when I was in the army. They called me the preacher in Fort Riley, Kansas. I was the only guy in 130 men in our company. I was the only guy in the 201st Aviation Company that had a Bible. And I kept it on my nightstand. Right beside my illicit materials. And then we'd get good and high at times. And we'd start, you know, hey man, dude, listen to this, man. And I used to get them guys about midnight, get them good and toasted. I said, did you guys ever read the book of Revelation, man? <laughs> Dude, man, look at what's coming. And guys would be, wow. But nobody ever repented. Next morning, it was back to business. You know, I'd scare the fire of them at night. Next morning, back to business. Amen. The world. So it says, don't be conformed to the world, and don't let your body stop you, but instead... Be transformed. That's the word metamorpho, which literally means to change from one creature to another, like a caterpillar to a butterfly. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, in my Bible, in the New King James Bible, it, it, it gives a caption for this next segment, and it, the caption says, Serve God with spiritual gifts. For I say through the grace given to me, <clears throat> to everyone who is among you, roadblock number three. What's the next thing that's going to stop me from being effective in my service to Christ with the gifts he's put inside of me? What's the middle letter of the word sin? I. What's the middle letter of the word pride? I have a little saying that I've rehearsed for years. I, me, my, these must die. So pride comes in, and pride gets you to thinking you're higher than you are. And there's a strategy behind that. The strategy behind getting you to think you're more high than you are is to neglect the opportunities that are in front of you waiting for a greater moment. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Why? Because there could be an opportunity staring you in the face for service to the body of Christ, but well, I ain't doing that. I'm too high and mighty to do that. 
And it'll stop you from fulfilling your call. Why? Because in the kingdom, just like in every other endeavor, he who is faithful in little will be made ruler over much. But he who is unfaithful in little will never be made ruler over much. And when you come into the kingdom, you start at ground zero with Jesus in trustworthiness. You come in and you earn trust. Trust can take years to earn and moments to lose. Amen. You know how that works, right? Your wife could be faithful to you for 20 years and just cheat on you one time. And that would take a long time to get over, wouldn't it? You can forgive her or forgive him if it was your husband, but you know what? All of a sudden, it's like trust is gone. Now, where, where, where were you? Why didn't you answer your phone? I drove by there. Your car wasn't there. And all that mess begins. Suspicion. Man, it's a horrible way to live in, in a covenant, you know. So pride will stop us from that beginning in Christ. I can't even be faithful with this little thing. And what wars against our faithfulness? The first three things. The, the thing that keeps us from being faithful to God is our body, which wants to do wrong things. Our the worldliness that wants to come in and conform us back to it. And then pride, thinking we're too good anyway. You know, people are going to live and die in the church and never fulfill their call because they thought they were too much to do something simple to get started. Man, I remember when, when I was in church and uh, my mentor, my first mentor's name was Rufus Wynot. He's the missionary we support in Inclusion of Polka, Romania. Uh, Rufus was my first mentor. And uh, I'll never forget the day I was, I was kind of meandering after a service. And, and Rufus walks up to me and he goes, uh, hey Dave. And I said, yeah. And he goes, uh, pastor asked me about you. He's been watching you. I was like, now I'm in a, you know, a very large at that time, they were 1,500-member church, and so when the pastor was watching you, that was something different. And I said, really? And he goes, he likes what he's seeing. He likes the way you move quickly to situations. I wasn't even an usher. I was just helping any way I could. I remember one day, me and a friend of mine, Rudy, were standing there, and the pastor walks up to us, and we were having a men's breakfast in the cafeteria of the church. Rudy and I are standing there talking, and Pastor Bob walks up, and, how you doing, guys? Doing good, Pastor. How you doing? And I'll never forget, he just looked down, and he said, boy, these chairs got a lot of stuff on them, don't they? And he's turned around and walked away. Rudy looked at me, and I looked at Rudy, and I said, what time, where, and, and what do we need? You bring the bucket, I'll bring the soap. We'll get the janitor to let us in, and we cleaned a couple hundred chairs. You think Pastor Bob didn't go back and check? I guarantee you that was a test. But some people are too, I ain't doing that. I'm an apostle of God. In your own head. And then you woke up. So... God, he says, think soberly. <laughs> Amen. Let's just do it this way. Just imagine you're a building. And each building is a level of maturity, a level of fulfilling responsibility, a level of walking in the Spirit. Imagine where you are in your own thinking and then cut that in half and you might be close. I said that with a smile. <laughs> Why? Everybody has a tendency. You know, it's amazing. <laughs> Every time I, you know, well, uh, I'm not going to get into that. <laughs> Let me just say this. We all have a tendency to see ourselves through a preconscious filter that makes us see ourselves as more faithful than we really are more anointed than we really are, skinnier than we really are, <laughs> taller than we really are, better looking than we really are. Huh? 
That's why you're the last one to know when your breath stinks. <laughs> Amen. For God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. You have nothing you weren't given. Therefore, you have nothing to be proud of. Anything you, get, you, you have was through impartation from another. So you didn't start anything with God. He initiated with you. Come on. Amen. Come on. So we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. And everybody, this is a, the next problem. Function disjunction. Every time a person gets operating in their function, they get mad at everyone else for not being in their function. Well, your function isn't my function. Why should I be mad at you when you're not doing what I'm doing? Because you don't do what I do. Your gift package is as individual as your fingerprint or your retina or your DNA. You have a spiritual DNA that you're, there's only one of you. No one can do what you do how you do it. When God made you, he didn't start up a clone factory. He made you unique and individual. That's why the worst thing you can be is a bad imitation of someone famous. You're anointed to be you. I'm anointed to be me. Now, I may pick up mannerisms. I may, from being around people, I may pick up cliches or ways of doing things. But I'm talking about cloning. I'm talking about... You're going to try to do what I do. You can't do what I do, and I can't do what you do. And it's foolish to even try. Because each one of us have been given a gift package. And I don't, I don't like to call it a gift. I like to call it a gift package. Your gift package is made up of several different components. Your personality is part of your gift package, which is your temperament. Your Spiritual giftings, which are Holy Spirit gifts, are part of your package. Your motivational giftings is what we're going to look into tonight. That's part of your gift package. And then there's a fourth part of some people's gift package. And only a few have this, and that is ministry, uh, five, what we call five-fold ministry gifts or governing gifts in the church. The five-fold ministry gifts, the only difference between the gift of prophecy and the gift of prophet is the gift of prophet has been given a grace by God to govern in the house. Prophecy can be used in exhortation, comfort, edification, revelation, but prophet governs. That's the difference between a soul winner and an evangelist. An evangelist governs in the house of God. The difference and so we, we know that there are those governing gifts. And those governing gifts do not necessarily have to be someone paid by a church. There are many what we call bivocational governing gifts. People who work, I've worked many years while still being, quote, full-time ministry, but I've worked other jobs to make up for income when I needed to. So having gifts then differing, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped a verse there. We don't have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts then differently, differing according to the grace that is given to us. Again, it's a grace gift. I can't get a big head about what I have because it wasn't me. If I was the initiator of it, I might have a reason to be proud about it. But I was given, it was given to me. And when something's given to you, you have no room for pride in it. It was a gift. I can't say I earned it. I can't say it was given to me because I was so smart, so good looking, so successful, so talented. I can't say any of those things. All I can say is the grace of God put this gift in me. And that's how I accept my gift. Having gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. And so according to the grace means the measure of grace. Different gifts have different measures. When you go back in the Old Covenant, you'll find that when, when uh, Moses needed to delegate authority, he received some advice from his father-in-law Jethro. And he, what he did was he went and made leaders of 10, leaders of 50, leaders of 100, leaders of thousands, 
leaders of ten thousands. Those are grace endowments. You say, well, how do I know what my grace endowment is? What's your level of influence right now? That's your grace endowment. Some people in here say, well, I'm a, you know, I'm a leader of four. Four people look to me for spiritual advice. Some people say, well, I'm a leader of 20. You know, 20 people I know look to me as an elder or a mentor in their life. Look to me for spiritual advice. So you have grace given according to a measure. That measure can increase, but there's this thing, uh, uh, Maxwell calls it the law of the lid. And that is, you can't outgrow your development. There will come a time where your lid stops you from being promoted. It's called the Peter Principle in the business world. You're promoted to the point of incompetence. You know, there have been a lot of successful salesmen who, because they were so good in sales, they promoted them to a sales manager and they bombed. Why? They were a great salesman, but they never had the grace to manage people. Now, whether that grace was never developed in them or if it just wasn't in them, it doesn't, you know, either way, you've got to find that out. And so it's the same way in the church. You can grow to a certain level in a certain situation. Let me just put it this way. There are singers who could sing in a Bible study. There are singers who would be very competent to sing in a church of 70 people. There are singers that could sing in a church of this amount of people. And then there are singers that will sing in mega churches. And you'll find that the higher level, the more developed and the stronger grace gift is in that person. Now, some people don't have the sense to recognize that. I have a grace gift of influencing you guys and the people that we're connected to. T.D. Jakes has a grace gift much greater than mine. He influences the world. Joe Olstein has a grace gift of influence much greater than mine. He writes a book, and he never has to take a salary from the church again. Why? Because his book's a million, multi-million dollar bestseller. Now, I don't compare my grace gift with his. God apparently knows what he's doing when he put him over that church and gave him that influence. God knew what he was doing when he put me over this church and gave me this influence. He knows what he was doing when he put you over whatever area of influence you have in your life. Now, our faithfulness and these other things will either help us to grow, develop, and be promoted to our point of incompetence. Because everyone will usually have a cap or a grace level. You know, when I, when I try to share with, with people who are wanting to be a part and be effective in ministry, it's very difficult because a lot of people see what I do up here and think, I'm called to do that. When it's not really the ministry call inside you, it's a desire for honor and glory. And until you can learn to discern the difference, man, it's hard to discern the difference from wanting honor and glory and wanting to be famous or wanting to be in front or wanting to be in charge than the call of God. Because really the most humiliating place to be is in charge. It's the most difficult grace to walk in. And the Bible says, don't many of you desire to do that because you're going to have a stricter judgment on you. You know, we have a stricter judgment on those among you we call leaders than those who we don't call leaders. We have different levels of accountability. We have a certain level of accountability to be a member of the rock. You, we tell you, when you join as a member, you agree in a covenant agreement with myself I will support this house with my attendance, my God-given gifts of service, and my tithes and offerings. If you don't tithe here, you broke the covenant. If you don't serve here, you broke the covenant. You voided yourself as a member. You're not a body part. You're a hitchhiker. Well, if you can't be faithful in that little thing, who's going to make you ruler over anything? If you can't be faithful in church attendance, you, we can't promote you any further. You've been promoted to your point of incompetence.
still want to know how to work in your gifts? Amen. Amen. Having given then gifts differing, let us use them. This is another problem. We got all kinds of spectators in the church, not very many participators. Come on. It's easy to sit and watch me learn from my gifts, watch other people learn from their gifts, but I ain't doing nothing. Or we won't ask you to do anything that's as great as you are. Again, we're back to thinking more highly of yourself. Than you are. All these things are roadblocks to keep you from fulfilling your call. When I scrubbed those chairs that day in that cafeteria with Rudy, I was just setting myself up for the next question. Pastor's been watching you, and he'd like you to be a part of the ministerial team. Now, in the church I came from, the ministerial team was equal to what we call our, our uh, altar team here, our prayer team. And so I, when I was invited to be a part of that, it was awesome because I got to pray with people. I led hundreds. The first two years I was saved, I got more people saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost than most people would in a lifetime. Hundreds of people. I led to the baptism of the Holy Spirit because I was given the beautiful opportunity of closing the deal. Because this is what these guys are. They're closers. They close the deal. Amen. How awesome responsibility. I learned to do so much in that situation. And then one day I got asked to represent our church at the county jail. What an honor and glory. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I thought I'd died. Me? You would trust me to represent this house? And I was the only one that was gone. They, their jail ministry had died in the church. And so when I was given the opportunity, not only did I become a faithful minister to those who are incarcerated, I built the jail ministry. And when I left, I had probably, I don't know, six to 12 people ministering faithfully under me when I left two and a half years later. I'll never forget, after we moved to Jackson and started our first church, I'm not telling you this to blow my own trumpet. I don't need to do that. I'm setting an example of faithfulness and showing you that when you're faithful, God rewards you. I'm showing that as an example in my own life. When I moved to Jackson, Ohio and started our first church, I had been there probably two or three months. And one day, Pastor Bob called me. He said, Dave, I just got a call from Bobby Cox. Bobby Cox was the chaplain who worked for the sheriff's department who was over the correctional facility, Tarrant County uh, Corrections. And uh, there was about a couple of thousand inmates in that it's a, it's a big place. Their county jail had a couple thousand people. I think it's up to like three, three to five thousand inmates right now in the Tarrant County Correctional Facility. He said, Bobby Cox called my office and told me that you were the most faithful assistant chaplain who had ever served in that jail under him. And he had been in that tenure for probably 10 or 15 years. And I just started laughing because if you would have known the hell that man put me through to try to make me quit when I started, you wouldn't have believed it. In fact, my introduction to Bobby Cox, I walked in and, and I went through their course. You had to go through a little course on, before you could minister in the jail and go through you know, their background checks and all that stuff. I walked in and he pulled me in his office. He shut the door. He pulled his finger. I said, I know who you are and I know where you're from. And I don't want your tongues and I don't want your healing in my jail. Do you understand me? That was my introduction to the chaplain. Three years later, he's calling my pastor saying I was the most faithful man ever served him. He put me in a cell for nine months where he, they had told him, we do not want a preacher in our cell. And I was cussed out, spit at. No one was allowed to come out and listen to me preach, so I preached into the air for nine months. Not one person, one person, I take that back, one person came out to hear me preach. One person. I'll never forget. I'd been there for months. Not one person would come out. I'd just start preaching and preach to nobody. 
All of a sudden, one day, I walked in, and this little Hispanic guy was sitting at the, in the day room at the picnic table, and he had a Bible, and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. You mean I get, some, I get a preach and someone listens? And so I started preaching, man. Son, you'd have thought I was T.D. Jakes that morning. All of a sudden, the tank boss, this big old dude, man, he comes walking out. He, they called me Sycamo in the cell. He goes, Sycamo, you're an idiot. Looked at him, I said, what, what do you want? He said, that man don't speak a word English. He's being deported. <laughs> and I looked at him, I said, he may not understand the word I'm saying, but you understand every word I'm saying. And I just kept right on preaching. They come out and spit on me, cuss me out. Nine months. Twice a week. And it wasn't just a 30-minute service. I had to stand there for 90 minutes with no one to listen to me. I fasted, I prayed, I studied just as much as I do for this service here. I can't even get people to, well, never mind. I'm talking about faithfulness. You want to be promoted? You got to be faithful. You think my body, I remember one day, I remember the alarm went off because every Sunday morning I got up at 5 a.m. I, I, I fasted. I never, every Sunday for three years, they provided us the best donuts in town and coffee. And I never ate one donut in three years because I fasted every Sunday morning for the men I was preaching to. Never ate one donut. Never drank nothing. Water. <laughs> I remember one morning the alarm went off. I looked over. It's 5 a.m. Sunday morning. Everybody else is sleeping in. And I said these words. I don't want to go and they don't want me to come. <laughs> and I heard this voice inside me say, what are you doing? Nothing, sir. I'm walking to the shower just like I always do. <laughs> Let us use them. The church just uses me for my gift. That's because God heard your prayer. Lord, use me. <laughs> what did you want us to do with your gift? Sit around and praise it? You want to lay down in a lawn chair and we'll get a little fan, some grapes and... Oh, high and mighty one, we'll never use you. Please. Please. Now, we're going to kind of run through this. Oh, my goodness. I guess we're not. What happened to the time? What did you guys do? It was a worship team. They went too long again. You know, they always give me a hard time about it. Yeah, we're a little late tonight, my kids specifically you went a little late tonight dad I said I told Nicole I said it's okay for you to go off in the spirit for an hour <laughs> oh that's fine oh yeah because you get to go first but if I go off in the spirit for an hour you went too long dad you know that's how that thing works it's tough ministering with family we'll just use the first one and then we'll close tonight. Having gifts then differing, let us use them. If prophecy. Now, if you have... Now, these gifts are what we call the motivational gifts. These are different from the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit that he imparts. These are different from the fivefold ministry gifts. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. These are gifts that are in every one of us. And these gifts work as a nature... They work as a part of our temperament. These are, I believe, inborn us. I believe you were born with these. With, that's why we call them motivational gifts. That's why I do that thing I do. And each one of these gifts has an expression. And we've been teaching on the love of Christ the last couple services. The love of Christ is expressed through you as you allow your gift to be used in the service to the body. 
And so it gives you purpose and takes you out of the spectator and makes you a participator in the glory of God. And so instead of just watching, you actually get to become a part. Amen. Prophecy. If your gift is prophecy, let us prophesy according. Oh, I just got a text. Jamie's texting Nicole. He's talking about you, talking all kinds of smack. I see you. I just got it. Popped right up on my iPad. I love technology. Thank you, Gary. It's just like the Holy Ghost. He'll tell on you. I think that was a spiritual unction right there. Jamie is redder right now than Liam's face after an hour in the sun. Prophecy. People who have prophecy gifting, (laughs) they have a tendency to see everything black and white. This word prophecy, a, a lot of the motivation, there are gift tests. You can go online and find them and take them for free. But they're called motivational gift uh, assessments. They're not really a test. You can't get a right or wrong answer. They just assess through you choosing how you think. They'll give you like a list of five different things. And you pick the one that most is like you. And that helps you assess your gifting. And so these motivational gifts, if you're prophecy, a lot of these tests call it perceiver. Perceiver. In other words, inside you, there's just that natural gift to be able to perceive things. You you tend to perceive motives. You tend to perceive right and wrong. And you tend to have a tendency toward right and wrong. In other words, you stay off the gray zone and you move in good and evil, not okay. If you're in prophecy. Well, everything, the, the thing with prophecy is... Even though you have a grace of God, and I believe that grace is to expose misrepresentations of the kingdom and to help people understand what the kingdom's really like, one of the warfares against prophecy and people who have a motivational gift of prophecy, here's some of your warfare. This is your gift, your war. You'll tend to be legalistic and self-righteous. You'll tend to think you're higher than other people because you see what they don't see. And that's, you got to be very cautious if you have a motivational gift of prophecy that you don't fall into pride and legalism. And that you don't remember to marry grace with the letter of the law. You know, we've got to have a, we've got to have a bird that flies with two wings, truth and mercy. And sometimes prophecy people will get in a spin. <laughs> They'll be flying. With, they're like an airplane in a stall. They got one wing flying and one wing stalled. And they'll go into a spin. And it's a death spin. Because they become all truth and no mercy. And so that's part of your warfare if you're prophecy motivated. You got to remember to walk in love. You got to remember to add grace to your gift. And you've got to remember that, yes, there is right and yes, there is wrong. But we've got to remember where the blood of Christ comes in. And we cannot begin to walk in a place of demanding such perfection out of people that our revelation becomes their law. I learned that years ago that when God gives me a revelation about prayer, for example... I'll never forget, this was a great wake-up call to me as a young pastor... We were doing morning prayer every morning, and, and I had the revelation we were going to pray every morning at 6 o'clock, and, and I had tried to get the whole church to show up, you know, or everybody that could, not I remember one day this lady come up to me crying, and she'd been coming to prayer for a couple of months, and I'm like, what's the matter? And she said, I'm in such bondage. And I said, bondage to what? She said, Prayer. I said, bondage, I have to be here every day for an hour. 
And I said, you mean you don't want to be here every day for an hour? No, I have to be. And, and I heard this inside me. Your revelation is her legalism. See, I had the revealed knowledge of prayer. She was doing it as a work. I was doing it from a grace understanding of desire. She was doing it, a, I have to do this or God will punish me. If I don't pray for an hour, God's there ready to smack me. And I immediately began to say, oh my gosh, what have I done? What have I done as a leader? You know, I got a revelation years ago on music. And Larry was a part of this revelation because Larry was a, a rock and roll guitar player. And he was always, um, you know, playing in the world. And when he came into the church, his gift was so incredible. And I got into an influence of, of a teaching called the profane and the holy. And I got the revelation that I'm not going to listen, you know, as entertainment. I don't want to listen to a bunch of secular music that is, you know, there's, there's qualifications for music. And that is whatever is good, whatever is pure, if there be any praise, if there be any virtue, think on these things. So I began to try to qualify our music. And, of course, there wasn't a lot of worldly music that was those things. You know what they say about country western music. One guy's crying because she left. The other guy's crying because she came back. <laughs> you know, we used to do this thing in the 80s. It was called backmasking. And when we had the old vinyl record albums, we, us kids, we'd get in our bedrooms. and, and uh, or Actually, this was in the 70s. And you could spin the record backwards and listen to it on the speakers. And there were coded messages. You know, like another one bites the dust. That, that song... Um, Dun, dun, dun. Another one bites it. If you spin that record backwards, it says, I want to smoke marijuana. And it's just as clear as crystal, you know. And so the, the, we were into all this, you know, back masking and stuff. And so, man, I didn't want nothing to do with that junk, you know. So I was being very clear. And then in this profane and holy doctrine, all of a sudden we began to say, which beat, you know, because there was all these missionaries coming back saying, these rock and roll beats are the same beats that they use in the tribal witchcraft ceremonies in, in the dark countries. And so we begin to try to discern which beats are of God and which beats aren't of God. And so Larry, as he played the, the guitar, I said, Larry, you know you can play the guitar without the gift of God. But he was just learning to play the keyboard. So I said, don't play the guitar in church anymore. Play the keyboard because you need the Holy Ghost to play that. You don't even need the Holy Ghost to play the guitar. And so we didn't let Larry play the electric guitar in the church for, what, three or four years? Yeah, three or four years. He didn't play the electric guitar. Now, when we had a youth event, we'd let him play. We sanctified him for that night. But in worship, you know, we, we wouldn't let him play. And uh, we were with Kevin up in Michigan and... And Kevin said, David, that's crazy. That's the dumbest thing I ever heard, something like that. You know how graceful Kevin is, you know. And then, again, I, I, I had to hear from God, and, and the Lord spoke to me and, again, confronted me about, you know, your revelational music has become legalism to Larry. And so we redeemed him back into his guitar days. And he was baptized back in, and he's been playing guitar ever since. Amen. Thank God for it. Now, he could have, he could have got mad and left the church. But he had as much grace for me as I have for him, you know. And one thing about walking as a family and walking, we, we walk through sometimes. We have to have grace for one another. He knew I was a young pastor, and he was a little older than me. And uh, I think he knew one day I'd find the balance in that thing. And we did. And he got to learn to play the keyboard real well in the meantime. <laughs> Amen. So my prophecy motivation is I see black and white. I, I have that prophecy motivational gift. And so I do see black and white. And so we're constantly... You know, trying to, just, trying to figure out, I don't want my revelation to become your legalism. But at the same time, we have to have standards in the church. And we have to have areas where we say, 
go, no go. Why? Because if we left it up to the flesh, there wouldn't be anything wrong with anything we do. Why? Because it's every man, the Bible says it, the way of every man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord weighs the spirits. And so we have to go back in and try to find those balances between legalism and grace. I see a huge segment of the body of Christ at this time throwing, I mean, they, they, they have thrown sanctification in the toilet and they're embracing grace, they're embracing Christianity without repentance. And man, that's like running your fingernails down a chalkboard to me. And I'm going to blow a gasket every time on it. It's my motivational gift. You get someone who has a motivational gift of mercy, they're to the opposite extreme. Amen? And we'll get into that later. We'll go through each of these gifts and we'll talk about your gift, your war. Because just as I have to have a balance in my life between legalism and grace with my prophecy motivational gift, you'll have to have a balance in your motivational gift, whatever it is. Amen? And that's how it works. Your gift, your war. Amen? Amen. Each gift has a warfare with it. But we want to completely be able to express our gift and calling God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on up. Come on up, man. If I could get my prayer team up here tonight, I don't want to, I don't want to belabor this. I want to get you. I know some of you all need to get your children home. Hallelujah. But if I get my prayer team up here tonight, I just um, thank God for you. I thank God for your hunger and your thirst. I have a lot of pastors that say to me, Dave, my church just isn't hungry. Well, I answer back and say, really? I don't, I don't know how to answer that. Because it's just so good to serve among hungry people. Amen? It's so good to serve among hungry people. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness, they'll be filled. Would you stand with me tonight? Holy Spirit, we seal the words of your life into our hearts and I ask you Holy Spirit to again work with us daily that the spirit of truth will live in us not just the spirit not just the truth but the spirit and truth let truth and mercy kiss again in our midst that we may be governed according to your will in your kingdom. We thank you, Holy Spirit. And I just thank you that our understanding is being enlightened, that we're going to know the hope of our calling. We're going to know the hope of our calling. Just say it with me. Say, Holy Spirit, Spirit, show me me the hope hope of my calling. calling. Reveal Reveal inside me my purpose your plan for me show me how I fit in your big picture show me how I fit in my church with my people my tribe the ones you've connected me to and I will work hard with my warfare And the warfare will not stop me from producing in the kingdom. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. And amen. Hallelujah. Tonight as you're uh, being dismissed, if anyone needs prayer, please come up and get prayer. You know the drill. Don't leave if you need prayer. Thank you for tuning in online with us tonight. Folks over in Fairmont, Columbus, all the places. God bless you. We love you guys. We bless you. We pray the anointing of God is on you. Have a great week in the Lord. And we'll see you.